We are live. Hello and welcome to the second CIFWA chat hour. If you don't know what CIFWA stands for, it's the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. The second F is silent. Uh, I am the president of CIFWA. Uh, we're going to spend the next hour chatting about things science fictional and fantastical, uh, mostly having to do with the organization. And I'm going to kick things off by having our participants introduce themselves, starting off with Bud Sparhawk. Bud. Hello, I am the treasurer, uh, excuse me, chief financial officer of CIFWA, as of the last bylaw change in there. And uh, I take care of all the money in the organization, the all, all the bills and all of the uh, income comes through Kate and I, our operations uh, direct, director. Uh, right now, CIFWA is in very good flavor. We have close to $1.3 million in total assets, of which three quarters of which is, is investments in various uh, bond markets and also in our checking and savings account on there. Uh, we receive income from uh, donations, and any donations to CIFWA, the EMF, the legal fund, or any other thing that you care to mention is a tax donation for you. And if you donate money to us, we will send you a very nice letter that you can include with your IRS return saying that, yes, this was a legal uh, mm -hmm. contribution to a 501c3 organization. Uh, we had a little bit of a bump last year with regards to our income. We had about... Uh, $80,000 we were expecting that did not show up. We're hoping that will be rectified this year. But by and large, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, the budget, so far, we are about uh, th about 90% through our budget, and we've done some cost constraints this year. have avoided doing certain activities, and uh, we will end the year pretty close to what we had budgeted for the previous year, from the previous year. So, now, Bud, you mentioned the mysterious acronym EMF. Do you want to explain to people what the EMF is? The Emergency Medical Fund is uh, was set up to help uh, writers who have medical problems, uh, costly medical problems that interferes with their ability to pursue a writing career. Uh, the submissions requests for EMF loans come to me. I send them to the uh, Emergency Medical Fund Committee. They review the case. They may come back to the to the person who made the request and ask for further information, and then they make a determination as to whether and how much of a grant we can give to them. All monies issued by the EMF to a recipient are held in close confidence, and they are they are grants rather than loans. We used to have loans, but uh, we've since we became a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization, we are now able to give uh, go grants that do not require payback. Super, thank you. Derek, want to introduce yourself? Yeah. <clears throat> so my name is Derek Prinskin. Um, for CIFWA, I'm the volunteer coordinator. Um, and my job within CIFWA is to hear from all of the other. Um, people who may need volunteers, whether they be members of the boards or MIDI or um, ad hoc volunteers, and then I try and find people who would be interested in doing those things. Um, what I can say is after the recent uh, weekend meeting we had in Chicago a few weeks ago, um, there's a lot of new energy, a lot of new initiatives we'd like to try, and so there's a lot of new opportunities for people who want to get more involved with CEPWA. And uh, I can uh, help you find some place where you you, you might uh, want to to help us out. And there's a whole range of different activities, whether they be um, high responsibility, low responsibility, high time commitment, low time commitment, high responsibility, uh, or just you know pushing papers around. All of the different kinds of jobs need to be done. And uh, I totally get that people have different comfort levels with what they'd like to uh, commit to. So that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. And then we do have volunteers that range from all levels, all of them equally valued. I know that. And we'll talk more about the volunteer experience because this is in part a propaganda 
propaganda vehicle for CIFA, right? So we want to include that. Erin, how about you? Want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Erin Hartshorn. Um, I'm basically a volunteer. <laughs> I've been helping out with editing and formatting the CIFA forum for the last couple of years, and now it's getting um, it's switching from every two months to twice a year, so that's not going to be as much of a time commitment. Um, I also hang out in the CIFWA chat room most days of the week to answer questions and talk to people who just want to drop by like a casual water cooler. And I'm a member of the new Member Satisfaction Committee, which is looking at how to help people, help encourage people to join and get them to stay, <laughs> find out why people are leaving, and, and see if we can encourage them not to. <laughs> Oh, awesome, me. and that's in the SIFWA chat uh, room for people that aren't familiar with it. If you're a member and you're on our discussion forums, go up to the left-hand side of the page, and you'll see a thing that says chat. And often there is a number up there that indicates how many people are in there chatting away. Often there's at least one or two procrastinating and delighted to talk about. I have seen conversations ranging from unicorn poop to uh, Patreon tips, to kind of, and, and actually you've seen a lot of volunteer uh, efforts actually get organized in there, which is really kind of cool. Awesome. Kate, will you introduce yourself? I will, but I first want to say that Aaron was also instrumental in launching the Nebula Beta website along with Michael Capobianco, so thank you so much for that. Um, we did release that. Um, but before I go into all of that stuff, my name is Kate Baker. I'm the operations director for CIFWA, second half silent, um, and I have my hands in everything, so everything from event planning to budgets to day-to-day uh, -day operations, member uh, satisfaction, if you will, and um, I work with everybody you see here and a lot more people, um, so if you ever need anything, it's operations at CIFWA.org. And I am Kat Rambo, the CIFWA president, which means that basically I answer a lot of emails and then every once in a while I'll say, Kate, do you have the answer to this? Or Bud, do you have the answer to this? And they tell me. So it's very handy. So one of the things I asked Kate to do is put together a list of our most recent members. And so I thought we would read them off to acknowledge those folks and then let's talk a little bit about kind of how can those folks make the most of their first few months in CIFWA? What can they expect? And maybe uh, start off with Derek talking about how to volunteer if they want to do so. And then we'll kind of maybe even uh, talk about how we became members and uh, what it was like. Uh, I have a mildly amusing story. Maybe. I don't know. Kate, what's the list of new people? All Who right. I mean, to the org. So big welcome to Zach Chapman, who joined as an associate. Liz Coulter, active. Rachel Dunn, active. Dana Chambly Carpenter, active. Eric Fischel, and I'm sorry if I'm murdering some of your names. Um, Elliot Harold, Ryan Huckabay, uh, Kevin Eikenberry, L.S. Johnson, David McDonald, Amy J. Murphy, Luke Nolby, John Rollins, Nancy Schrock, Keith Soares, and Carlo Yeager Rodriguez. So welcome to the organization, and if you need anything, again, we're all here to help. That's awesome. That's within the last month. That's within the last month. And we do have a, because of the nebulas, we have a slight backlog. So I will get to you if you have submitted an application. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I just had a query this morning that you and I were talking about. So cool, cool, cool. Well, so I will say when I became a member, the reason that I joined CIFO is I was at Dragon Con uh, like a, 12 years ago, and Ann Crispin uh, was doing a writer's workshop. And she said to all of us, here's what you do. And she kind of sat up there and kind of steepled her fingers and said, yeah, this is what you're going to do. And she said, you're going to uh, get your first CIFWA Pro publication, and you're going to immediately join CIFWA, and you're going to volunteer because you get much more out of it if you volunteer. So, Derek, would you be willing to talk a little bit about kind of what opportunities are currently around? And, I don't know, talk a little bit about the volunteer experience and why you're crazy enough to agree to, to be the person wrangling that, because it's a pretty big job. And 
it's a lot of volunteers, right? Uh, yeah, we've got uh, almost 200 volunteers, I think, on uh, my list, and those people are spread across uh, different committees who do things ongoing. So, for example, there are there's a group of people people that meets with Bud, for example, who have financial experience who give advice to the chief financial officer. There are people who get who we who get together on the short fiction committee, talk about opportunities for new members in short fiction. Um, there are uh, a number of other committees that are just being formed right now. Uh, one of them is uh, the engagement committee, which is to try and coordinate and uh, get a little more strategic in how we do our outreach to different groups and uh, different places uh, with CIPWA and, and to advance how uh, we, we, we engage with the, the world outside. Um, there's also uh, at CONS, we, we need help as well. And uh, what happens there is uh, CIPWA will have a presence at Worldcon or we'll, we'll have the Nebulous Weekend and there's lots to organize there. And there's people like Kate and people who help Kate who do a, a lot of work, but it would also be wonderful if there were extra pairs of hands to give a little bit of a, an extra push from uh, time to time. And uh, sometimes it's as simple as, uh, you know, in the last six months you've said to me, Derek, we need to have a, a certain kind of graphic for this kind of thing. And, Looking through the Rolodex, it was a matter of uh, finding out uh, what what we could do for that, and we did find great volunteers. We have awesome volunteers. I mean, that's in, that is the only reason that I stick in the office is because we have such amazing people to work with. So, Bud, how long have you been our CFO? Mr. Sparhawk. There we go. There we go. I have. Uh, I, it's been proposed that I take the position of permanent CFO because nobody votes, nobody volunteers to run against me, and everybody seems to vote for me. So uh, it's sort of a unanimous curse. Uh, eight and a half years. Eight and a half years, and that's at a total of ten years on the on the uh, committee on the committee on the uh, board because I was an Eastern Regional Director for a year and a half before I took on the job of direct of CFO, Treasurer at that time. So why do you stick with it? I mean, that, that's a long time. It's a long time to be doing anything. And, and I know that CFO actually takes up a significant chunk of time. So what makes you stick with it other than the fact that we keep voting you in and would probably write you in even if you tried to step down? Well, what's, what happened is that uh, I started building an organ, a financial organization that was appropriate to the size of the uh, financial package that uh, CIFWA has. I think we were close to 900000 at the, at the initially, uh, most of it in money market and various checking accounts. Uh, I consolidated as much as possible, put as much money into reserves as we could afford, and then I went out and got a bookkeeper. The bookkeeper didn't work out too well the first year, so uh, Oz Drummond, who is a friend of mine, who's also a certified tax accountant, uh, said, why don't I take over the job of uh, a bookkeeper? I said, okay. And a year later, I promoted her up to controller bookkeeper. And this year, we hired a real bookkeeper behind her, so we have a three-level uh, three levels of management. We have the CFO position, we have a controller who basically keeps the CFO honest, and we have a bookkeeper who keeps both of us honest. And then we have a financial committee on the side that reviews all our financial reports and acts as a surrogate for the gross membership, large membership. So if they have a question, somebody else will have a question and we address it immediately. They get to review all the financial reports before anybody else sees them. So it's a little bit of safety in numbers there. I have been accused of building an empire. That is false. And as soon as I hire the other ten people, you will see how smart this is. Well, and that, so you have it. So you have explained what you do, and you kind of uh, comment my question sideways. But why keep doing it? Are, are you know, if you're not building an empire, what are you getting out of it? Well, it beats beating my head on the head against the screen when I can't write. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I promised Brenda Clough years ago, she wanted me to run for president. 
And I said, no, 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 no. And then she said, why don't you run for director? And I said, no, 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 no. And she kept at it, and I finally said, look, I'll volunteer for something when I retire. And then I retired. And all of a sudden, it's the sudden truth jumps up like a brick wall in front of a speeding car. And uh, we got we I, I got on the board and uh, found I enjoyed the uh, camaraderie of the board members and being in on some of the mechanics of the organization. Uh, that was a time shortly after I took over the treasurer's position, we began rewriting the bylaws, we began writing an OPPM, and we started reorganizing the uh, CIFA into a professionally run organization. And we have continued to carry out that, uh, that mission since then. So I, it's taken us six years to get to where we are now, and it's probably going to take us another six years before we think it's right. And I think that camaraderie is a big part of it, right? I think, uh, for one thing, we do... I know Kate does multiple weekly calls. I do at least one weekly call with the, the team, and I, I think they are calls that I look forward to as much as anything, despite the fact that I come away with action items. And, and now I'm suddenly remembering several that I need to do before uh, this week's call. So Yeah, and Oz and, I, Oz and I and Val are in constant communication. I think the average day we exchange probably 20 or 25 messages on something having to do with the finances. Yeah, and that's, I know, like Kate and Maggie and I are always texting back and forth, sometimes just snarky stuff, uh, observations about our day, but also uh, bits that have to do with the running of the organization as well. So, hey, Aaron, will you talk about why you continue to do volunteer work? And how long have you been, a, tell us how long you've been a member and why you started doing volunteer work. I'm, I'm curious about that. I actually don't remember I think I joined in 2012 so that would be about four years now um, and I volunteered because I saw a need and I wanted to help um, it specifically the first thing I did for volunteering was um, I saw somebody commenting on the discussion boards and saying that well the CIFA forum hasn't been out for a while and what's the estimate on that and somebody else said well the secretary needs an editor or somebody to help get that out and I so I sent an email and I said hey I hear you need some help what can I do um, because that seemed to be the way to help everybody <laughs> it's just, but, I think for so many of us that's what happened, right? We were kind of like, oh, there's a need. And like I I joined in 2005 and first, I don't know how this happened, but I got pulled into uh, the copyright committee. And it was after there had been one of CIFWA's many controversies and, and somebody said, do you want to be on this committee? And I was foolish enough to say, sure. Uh, and then after that, kind of went dormant for a long time. <laughs> uh, but then when there were, uh, at some point, uh, the head moderator for the discussion forum stepped down, and I had experience running discussion boards, so I agreed to become the head moderator, and then from there, somehow got lured into the presidency, I think. I think partially, it is that sort of urge where it's like, well, let's, let's make sure this gets done. I'm not sure it's going to get done. If not, you know, somebody's got to do it. You know, and it's, it's, it's a kind of weird situation. So, uh, with new members, you will, as I think one of the things you'll see is volunteering lets you see a lot of the innards of the organization, uh, a lot of sort of the things that The things that you might not see if you're just sort of looking at the singularity or even just looking at the discussion forums. Um, so, Kate, tell us, like the new members, what do you think they should do to get the most out of their first month? Like, what should they worry about doing? I know they should, I personally because I'm very fond of discussion forums, feel they should get on the discussion forums mm -hmm. and, and make the most of them. But what else might they want to do? Um, well, just to answer Aaron, Aaron, because I have the magic 
magic portal into the database, you are correct, 2012, July. So you're coming up on your anniversary. Congratulations. Um, but as for new members, um, look at the new member packets because there's a lot of great information in the CIFLA handbook. Um, we have it electronically, so if for some reason your packet may have got lost in the mail or didn't get to you, uh, so, uh, shoot me an email and I can get that your way. Um, if you see a convention that CIFWA is going to be a part of, if you're going to the Worldcon, um, come up to the CIFWA suite. It's a great place to meet uh, members um, and uh, you know share a little bit about you know how how your writing career is going, what you hope to achieve in the future. And then uh, we do do the singularity, and it's it's chock full of information. So if you have a reading coming up that you'd like to share with the membership, uh, we can put that in there. Or if you've got a special project that we deem is appropriate for the singularity, we can we can definitely slide that in there as well. And I do suggest I I didn't know about the CIFLA suite at Worldcon for like the first five years of my membership, and I feel that I've lost value in that. Uh, because the CIFWA suite at Worldcon is a lot of fun. For one thing, there, there's free food up there, and it's also a kind of quiet space, which is always nice, because, you know, for most of us, we get pretty overwhelmed at cons. But the other kind of cool thing is you see a lot of the more established writers uh, come there and chat, because it's where they can meet a lot of friends, and it's just fabulous to sit there and listen to them reminiscing or talking craft issues or comparing, you know, current business stuff. It is just absolutely fascinating. And if I can just add, too, um, one of the things that you do when you fill out your membership, membership application is you're filling out what is going on in the directory should you show, so choose to show it. And that is val uh, valuable to both mem uh, members alike and the public who goes and searches uh, who the CIFA members are. You can adjust that in your privacy settings. And we encourage new members to set up a speakers bureau uh, profile. I'm going to promote the heck out of this as soon as you know, as as much as we can. Um, so if you haven't done that and you are a new member, uh, speakers.cifwa.org will get you there, and you can use your same sign-in and password that you use to access your member profile. I think we've got close to 190 people in there right now with a mm -hmm. kind of wide range of experience, which I think is pretty awesome. Derek, are there any volunteer opportunities? Like, let's say these new members want to get in touch with you about uh, new opportunities. What should they be doing? Uh, the very first thing is they should be going to uh, volunteer at stiffwood.org and sending me an email. Uh, we'll chat back and forth about what they're interested in, and then I can sort of lay out my cards of what opportunities are open right now. Uh, at the same time, uh, I just put a bunch of volunteer opportunities on the latest Singularity, and I'm going to be trying to do that more regularly uh, as we get a bunch up. There's also a place uh, on the forums where there's a volunteer section, and I've been putting a few of our opportunities there as well. Um, and uh, so I guess the easiest thing, if you want to do the, the least amount of work yourself, is just shoot me an email, and I'll do the rest for you. But uh, if people want to read the Singularity or Forums, there are also some opportunities there. Um, I think on the, the, the first little while in CIFWA, I like the, the way the conversation's been going, and especially the, the boards, I, the introducing the self. I think my biggest, um, I live in Canada, so I'm far away from most people in CIFWA, and my, my, my big thing for, for when I first joined was when I introduced myself and then other people all said hi, and then I would watch other people say hi on the boards, and then I would go right to them. and. and and start little conversations about what people write and stuff like that, and that was the first sort of feeling like you've joined a community of a bunch of other people who are interested in what you're interested in as well. And um, that was one of the big things for me, and I, I appreciate that, that that was brought up as what, what should new members be doing right now. And there's uh, the boards. I, I know I'm very rah-rah about them, but, uh, like, for instance, one thing that we've put up in the last few months is if people are going to conventions, they mention where they're going, and other folks are welcome to send them postcards or bookmarks or whatever to stick out on the convention freebie table. And that's the sort of thing that uh, CIFWA can do, right? It can connect you with folks that want to uh, help you. Uh, if Don I can just... Oh, go ahead. Uh, just really quickly, so um, I know that we're talking uh, to the members directly, but I know a lot of people who are going to be watching this on YouTube aren't members yet. 
Um, we do have volunteer opportunities for you as well. In fact, that is exactly how I got into this organization. Um, they were looking for uh, volunteers to help with a certain project, and I sent my name in, and sure enough, I was picked uh, based on my skill set. And then, um, you know, it just so happened that, you know, uh, I was sort of chosen for this job after the fact. So, um, but yeah, I, if you are interested in the field or in the industry and you'd like to eventually become a, a CIFWA member, um, you know, volunteering and getting to know CIFWA members who are on these, uh, on these projects is, is a good way to, to understand what we're all about as an organization. And for people who don't understand the membership criteria, it's basically that we want you to be a professional uh, fantasy and science fiction writer and you have to prove a certain level of income from writing. And what is really cool is now that we've, uh, now that we're admitting people who are independently publishing and small press publishing, Kate has actually created a web portal that'll walk you through uh, it if you have questions. Uh, for novels, basically though, it's you, know, you have to be able to prove you made three thousand dollars from a single book over the course of a year, and the proof can come in you know Amazon spreadsheets it can come in a variety of ways but the kind of cool thing about that is right now uh, we are about to uh, admit game writers for the first time and uh, criteria are being voted on by the board right now and I expect to see them actually announced I would think this Kate do you think it's gonna go out this week maybe <laughs> maybe hopefully but it's, it's super exciting news and I'm very happy that the membership overwhelmingly approved it um, and uh, yeah, you'll see information, and we'll shout it to the stars when, as soon as it's ready for a, you know, public consumption. Yeah, then a, a press release will go out to all the the various uh, science fiction news outlets, and it'll be on the CIFWA blog, which you can access off mm -hmm. the CIFWA uh, website. Um, I'm really excited about this because I'm a longtime gamer. Uh, you know, I've been playing D and D since I was 12 years old, and my father brought home this little white, innocuous white box containing three little books that I had no idea would change my life. I'm curious how, I know Kate games as well. Erin, are you a gamer? Oh yes, oh yes. Um, I've been playing D&D off and on since high school. Um, my latest love is actually the Cypher System by Monty Cook. Um, I've backed a couple of the Numenera Kickstarters that he's done and it's a lot of fun. Um, one of the things is that only the players roll the dice. The GM isn't involved in any of the actual what happens, which makes you feel less like the GM is out to get you. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Derek, how about you? Are you a gamer at all? Uh, I was in uh, public school and high school, but uh, then I think, uh, you know, just life got away from me, and uh, since my writing career has been moving forward. I've sort of been focusing mostly on that, but I, it's something I want to get back to when I retire. <laughs> well, that's it. It takes up a lot of time. I ran a mud for uh, 15 years, basically, and it wasn't until I finally said, oh, I, maybe I should put this away, that I was able to get serious about writing. Bud, do you play games? See, there's a voyage in self in, in a revelation of, of each other here. Uh... I am known to occasionally play a game of solitaire when writing gets stuck. <laughs> no, I I used to play D and D, but then I stopped working for a company that had a deck ten, <laughs> and pretty much stopped that. Later on, I got into uh, Second Life, which is sort of a game, but it's not a game. And I was doing that for a year or two, and then I realized how much time I was wasting, and uh, dropped it. Uh, actually, after that, the only thing I used it for was they had a great 3D modeling tool that you could build things with. So I would build spaceships and other things that I needed to, in my story, and then I would look at them and be able to describe them a little better. But no, I'm not a gamer. That's awesome, though, that you were using it uh, for a tool like that. So for those of us that game, I... I what games are you playing right now? I will mention that I'm playing something called Fallen London on the uh, iPad, which is a turn-based game that I think is, is really fun. And then I continue to wade through Fallout uh, which or Fallout 4, 
mainly because it lets me do what I did in Skyrim, which is just sort of creep around at night shooting things. Uh, Kate, what are you playing right now? Um, Woohoo! Uh, so I get on every night with Neil and Sean from Quark's World, and we do Destiny on the Xbox, and it is awesome. And I just also bought Overwatch, which I am enjoying the hell out of right now. It is so much fun. It's kind of like Team Fortress 2, and they took all these elements from different other games like Titanfall, and um, you just kind of run around and try to eliminate each other. It's a great stress reliever when you work for Sifwa. Um, but yeah, uh, mostly I did PC games, and now I'm doing Xbox One, um, and then I've been known to do uh, uh, Star Wars RPG, so yay! <laughs> That's awesome. Erin, how about you? What are you playing right now? Um, my husband is putting together a kind of a homebrew using the Cypher system. Um, it's kind of a magic Wild West mashup it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. And meanwhile, while he's working on that, um, we've been doing a lot of board games, Dead Men Tell No Tales and Betrayal at House on the Hill. We've been doing a tabletop as well, a D&D tabletop, kind of old school, uh, with Randy Henderson, if you know, who wrote uh, Fin Fancy Necromancy and who is uh, just hysterical, uh, and our friends Yang Yang and Todd and Christy, who are just having a blast with that. All right, we should probably uh, talk about industry stuff. Um, Bud, last time you were not here, and we abused you briefly. Well, not abused, sort of affectionately abused you. But I was wondering if you would tell us how Balticon went for you. That is, you should address me as the Bud, please. Oh, I'm sorry, the Bud. How did the Balticon go? Balticon was a was an interesting event. Uh, for one thing, they quite were quite they were quite unprepared for the vast crowd that showed up. They should have been having George R. R. Martin and twenty of the past guests of honor there. They should have expected that there would be a little bit of excitement in town. But uh, the first day, I think the line for buying the tickets there went clear around the upper deck of the uh, the hotel. There was so many people, and that is all. They had almost 2,000 pre-registrations, so it it kind of got out of hand. It was a size almost the size of a Worldcon if Worldcon was held in one hotel, you know. That um, there was a, a mix-up. They tried new software to schedule the pro do the programming. Now you've got to understand the logistics of preparing for something this size. You've got to print up the little booklet that has the description of the program and the rooms and the times and so forth. That has to be done about has to be done at least a week in advance. Then you've got the little pocket program, a one sheet thing that has just the names of it and the times and places on it. That needs to be done about th finished about three days beforehand, so you can stuff all the all the gimme packages. Then there's the uh, the database itself, which is what the ops team ran on, and they're ones that produce what they call the daily rocket, which is all the changes in the schedule. Now, it's impossible to have something this size and have all of those documents and the online database, uh, online application, agree. So there was a lot of confusion of having people supposed to be in two places at the same time, or two programs being in the same room at the same time, or having, I'll take, give you an example of the type of thing that happened. Uh, I was supposed to be on a panel uh, about writing at 9 o'clock in the morning. I was also on a panel that was supposed to talk about uh, forgotten technologies at 9 o'clock at night. I picked up the Daily Rocket, and they had switched the two. So I went down, I said, okay, I'm on both panels, so no, no harm, no foul. So I went to the panel that was where I was supposed, supposed to be, in the, and people came in. And they didn't look like the usual crowd that would attend a writing panel. So I said, how many people in here are for forgotten technologies? And every hand went up. And I said, okay. And I waited for the, my other panelists, my other four panelists to show up. They didn't. And more people came in, and I asked the same question. 
nobody was there for the panel I thought I was supposed to be for. So I said, okay, I opened my book, I pulled out the sheet of paper on the extensive research I had done ten, 10 minutes prior to the meeting, to the panel, and said, we're going to talk about forgotten technologies for this hour. <laughs> so we started talking, and uh, I was, I had three items on there, I think. I talked about the chromium sword in ancient China and some other things. And then uh, we brought up the, uh, the uh, Antikythera device in, from Greece. And uh, somebody mentioned, said something that was wrong, and a guy over to his left said, you are wrong, and stood up and get a 10-minute talk on the Antikythera device and how it was analyzed, what its purpose was, and the fact that it had been 3D imaged and they were in the process of building a new one. And another guy said, what about the other thing? And he mentioned another Greek artifact that was, seemed to be mechanical, and he gave a little talk on that. And then somebody said, well, what about... What, what about this technology and that? Te how about batteries? Where are batteries? Well, the Greeks had it, the Chinese had it, et cetera, et cetera. So I had five panelists in the audience that, were, that ran the hour. It came time to say, well, we've, the hour is almost up. We're supposed to get out of here, you know, it's 10 minutes still. And nobody would shut up. And they kept talking. And people were coming in for the next panel, and they started contributing to this. I finally got up and said, I'm sorry, I have another panel. And I went out the door. And honest to God, four people followed me down the hall. They wanted to continue the discussion. <laughs> John Henry and uh, Bob Chase were supposed to be in a panel, but when they showed up, another panel was in session. So they were walking along, and they saw a room with a bunch of people in it and no panelists. And they walked in and says, what are you people waiting for? And they said, the blah, 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 blah panel. He said, okay, so he and Bob went in there and had that panel. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so awesome. And it's a good thing about science fiction fantasy writers is that we panel despite ourselves. You cannot keep us from paneling. We will self-organize. Exactly. You know. exactly. But I think, I think from the attendees' point of view, it was a wildly successful con. I think from a participant's point of view, there were some problems, uh, not unexpected. I did get one thing. I was on a signing with uh, Fran Wild and Charlie Strauss, and I'm watching the line, and the line died down, and this tall, gangly man comes walking up with one of Charlie Strauss's book and extends it to him and says, would you sign my book, please? And I looked over, and I said, oh, my God, that's John Shirley, who's almost never at these cons. And I thought, there is the passing of the torch from the old generation to the new. Oh, that's so cool. That's awesome. Well, I wanted, we do have one viewer question that I wanted to mention, and it is, uh, people were asking, what are the exact dates for the nebulas next year, uh, which, which Kate will be able to answer. We know, revealed last time, for those of you not in the know, that it would be an exotic Pittsburgh, and I, I believe it's been nailed down that it will be at the Marriott. But what are the dates, Kate? And when will it go up on the website? I actually don't have that information yet. Uh, we're looking at mid-May, um, but we're waiting on the contract from the Marriott. This is an ongoing process, but we did nail down where we'd like to have it. So uh, look for maybe second or third week of May, and that, that will probably be the, uh, the best time to... Uh, to mark your calendars, um, but we won't probably have any information for maybe about a month or so, uh, but we will be putting up pre-reg um, with the caveat that if the weekends do not work for you, you can always come back to us for a refund. We just want to get a general idea as to who is uh, excited as we are uh, to come to this next one. Well, it was cool because one of the things we did this year that we've never done before was started taking uh, pre-registrations mm -hmm. at the event itself and actually got some there, which I thought was awesome. Yes. Um, we have uh, this year, actually next week, we've got the Locus Awards here in Seattle, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. But in the course of mailing back and forth, uh, Aaron asked an interesting question, which is, uh, the Locus Awards and a lot of the other awards uh, places, uh, you're, I don't know, awards, institutions, or whatever, have a best collection award, uh, and sometimes even a best anthology award, uh, and I will 
because I only learned this when I did my own collection. An anthology is something that has multiple authors, whereas a collection is something that is a single author's uh, offerings in one book. But why is it, why don't we have a nebulous for best anthology? Do you think it would be a good idea? And I will let anyone on the panel shout out their answers to this. Bud, you always have an opinion on things. Do you want to? I think it would be very, very not cost effective to give Nebulous to 45 people who contribute to the Neb anthology. <laughs> it, would be an it would be an editor's award, not a writer's award. That makes sense, and I, I think like with uh, British Fantasy, right, they don't give out 45, not 45, you don't get 45 books and edit stories in the anthology, maybe 20, 20, 25. Uh, right. There was one anthology that had 365 stories in it. Okay, fair enough. The the, the story a day calendar does. Yes. Count. Who else would like to speak about the impracticability or lack thereof of best anthology award? I'm a short fiction uh, lover myself. Um, uh, I just don't know if that would work for us. There's the extra added cost of another trophy. <gasps> Bud. And then, um, no, the, the anthologies can get pretty big, because I'm going to totally tout this later when we, we talk about our, our, our stuff. But this is a doorstop, you know? And uh, it would definitely be an editor award. So, I mean, maybe if we were to expand our offerings towards the industry professionals that also enjoy the membership of SIFA, maybe that would be a good thing. But I'm not going to give an opinion either way, I think. And we do have editors and publishers in the mm -hmm. organization, right, as, as the affiliate members. Affiliate members, yep. Yeah, which is really good for a good way, again, for networking, which is handy. Mm -hmm. Eric, it looked like you unmuted for a second as though you were going to say something, but I might have hallucinated it. No, no, no hallucinations. I was, gonna, I, I was getting mixed up between collections and anthologies because I think we have a lot of anthologies that come out, enough to argue that it's worthwhile to take a look at an award. In terms of collections, I don't actually know the number of collections that come out, but if we're only looking at, let's say, two dozen or a, a dozen, then do, you know, do we really have enough to say that on a year-to-year -year basis is there enough to do something? But if the argument is about anthologies, then um, we probably do have enough. I think the criteria for an anthology would be very difficult to, to elicit. The, uh, do you judge the quality on the best story on there, the number of first-rate authors in the book? Do you judge it on how many authors are in the book? Do you judge it on how well the theme works or if there is a theme? I mean, there's all kinds of criteria one could use, all of which are equally valid. So I think it would be very difficult to come up with some sort of objective way to judge anthologies. We could give it to those people that have pay the best word rate. I'm in favor of that. Actually, that would be kind of cool, a special award. I don't yeah. know. Th then you get somebody gaming it for sure, right? It'd be like the uh, the tiny six-word story anthology or something like that. Aaron, do you, did you have an opinion about this? You're the one that raised the, the question. What do you think of On the Matter? Well, I don't know about anthologies. I, th I think that that could get really complicated. But I think that collections would be, you're only looking at individual authors. And so you're looking at a collection of short stories by one person, and you're kind of looking at their work as a whole, what they think is their best. And so I think that that is a legitimate thing that we could be looking at and judging. Um, for example, this year I know Ken Liu has one coming out, and I'm really looking forward to that. And... Um, yeah, I think that that is something that we could do. But yeah, again, I don't know about the China. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to, to trump on your words. Um, I would be curious to hear what the numbers are, actually, on the number of collections coming out each year. Because I, I, I think, I don't know, it seems to me like there's a, a goodly number. But I, I don't know. This seems like a good point to uh, segue. I asked people to come in with stuff that they've read recently that they wanted to kind of give a shout out, and I have three books I wanted to mention. 
And the first is, uh, I'm rereading Joe Clayton's series, the Diadem series. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. And I remember these vividly because I first read them in high school, and they all they all had naked ladies, basically, on the cover. And I remember kind of as a high schooler this being a bit of a crisis, right, because you don't want to draw attention to yourself. And I was at a Catholic high school as well, so this just was not going to fly. Um, but they're, boy, they're terrific. I've been reading, rereading a lot of series lately, and Clayton is one of the folks who really can pull it off. Um, speaking of anthologies, this is from a, a local press called Broken Eye Press. It's an anthology called Tomorrow's Cthulhu Stories at the Dawn of Posthumanity, edited by Scott Gable and uh, C. Dombrowski. And the reason I mention it is I think everything that Broken Eye has put out has been really solid, and this is just as solid as everything else. It's a really good, co uh, not collection, an anthology. Um, and finally, uh, Jeff Kennedy, just uh, I just got a copy of this from her, and it's a lot of fun. It's the pages of the mind, and if you're familiar with her Twelve Kingdoms series, it's set in it, and it has one of the characters, Daphne the Librarian. And so it is It is basically a librarian romance, uh, fantasy romance, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, partially, you know, if you've read in that world, uh, it's, it's nice to go back and visit some of those characters. And Daphne is one of the characters we're always like, you know, she needs a little bit more, and Jeff has given her her story. Uh, Bud, what have you read lately that you wanted to give a shout out to? Well, I just got a copy of the the Lost Fleet Shattered Spear, which is a latest Jack Campbell book. Uh, the book has particular interest to me because he dedicated the book to me, uh, which I thought was kind of nice, and uh, he he signed it for me, which I thought was a uh, an added added Philip on that, so it's nice. I just read. Uh, at last, the lightning, which is by a new new writer, and I Ada. Uh, oh God, I can't think of her last name now. But, Isn't that Ada Palmer? Yes, yes. And what I found interesting with that, even though it was pretty turgid reading, I mean, it's it's written at a very high level of language, and it's difficult to read. And about a page one hundred. I finally got what she was talking about as far as this world building that she had done and it, it her world building is magnificent and that alone spurred me to read the rest of the book and I'm hoping there's a sequel. That's awesome. I got that at uh, the Nebulas it was one in my book bag. Oh no, actually she gave me a copy uh, and I, I'm really looking forward to uh, reading that. It's on my shelf of next things. Derek, what have you read lately that you want to talk about? Uh, I don't read, I listen. Um, so I do uh, audio fiction, and uh, I've been really bad about reading uh, in the last year. I've been doing a lot of uh, nonfiction reading, a lot of science. And so just recently, I'm starting to get back into Clark's World podcasts, uh, Lightspeed, <laughs> Lightspeed podcasts, um, and The New Yorker uh, has some amazing podcasts as well that are for free. Um, and then when I road trip with my son, we listened to books together, and so I just listened to one called uh, Eye of Glass by Marie Bilodeau, and it's basically about a demon who wakes up, and she's basically a head with a spine, and she doesn't know why she's like this, and she's got to figure out what's happened to her, and, and in the process, she decides she wants to become a runway model, and so um, being a head with a spine disadvantages her in that way, but... It was a huge amount of fun to read, and then we finished that, and I tried introducing him on my last road trip to uh, Tarzan of the Apes, but the language of 1913 pulp fiction is is quite dense uh, for an 11-year-old or a 12-year-old, so um, there were some moments where he was very interested, and there were some moments where I was the one who was having far more fun than he was. That's interesting. Yeah, it's got it's the vocabulary is is one that sometimes uh, it was interesting. I was watching my goddaughter read uh, a number of months ago, and you could tell it was just like a word she'd bump up against that she didn't know. As soon as you hit a certain frequency of those, she was just like, "I'm out. I'm I'm done." Erin, what have you been reading lately that you enjoyed? Well, recently I. 
found um, an older one of Nanetti Okorafor's books, um, Akata Witch, which is one of her YA books. And I really enjoyed it, and then I was very pleased to discover when looking around that she's expecting to release a sequel to it this fall, so I'm looking forward to that. I've been reading Rachel Aaron's urban fantasy series, The Heart Strikers, which are dragons in a post-apocalyptic magical Detroit. And I've been catching up on Jean Luen Yang's um, graphic novels, um, Level Up, American Born Chinese, and his um, Saints and Sinners uh, Boxer Rebellion series. Those sound fascinating. I'd really like to talk to you more about those later on, get a, uh, add them to my reading list. Kate, what have you been reading lately? Okay, so again, I don't have time to read. I do a lot of short fiction stuff, but I just wanted to tell this one because this has got like all the short fiction you could possibly like want, and we're talking from like Analog, Asimov's, um, there's Mission Tomorrow, an anthology, uh, Meeting Infinity by uh, Jonathan Strawn. Um, the End Has Come, John Joseph Adams. I mean, these are all, like, CIFLA members that are awesome and by authors of, like, Kelly Robson, Ken Liu, and Leckie, um, Seth Dickinson. Um, so if you haven't gotten that, go get it. Um, but one of the things I really love about uh, working for Clark's World, too, is we do the Chinese translation project um, and getting to see the stories that are coming out of China and all of the other translations that are happening. It seems to be this building um, concept within other magazines. It's really exciting to see, you know, stories we maybe wouldn't have seen, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It's, it's the culture, the, the imagination, and uh, these stories are really, really well done. That's awesome. I, I, I'm excited about that because I'm, I, I think most of you know, I'm going to China in September uh, mm -hmm. for the first time and ex for the Chinese nebulas, which I think is going to be really exciting. So I've been trying to do, steer my reading in that direction. So Kate, are there any deadlines that our members should be aware of that are coming towards them in the next month or so, uh, CIFWA resources that they might want to be aware of. I know we just did a new release newsletter just went out. Is there mm. stuff? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're going to be at ALA in Orlando June 24th to the 28th. So if you did want to have any sort of promotional materials at the table, uh, the deadline to get that to us is June 15th. Uh, you can send uh, Tara LeMay an email at um, Tara dot lemay at cifla dot org. Um, we also have, um, let's see, the next singularity is going out uh, in two weeks, so if you have anything that you'd like to include, including that reading list, uh, appearances or anything that you'd like to do, um, if you can get that to me at operations at cifla dot org by, I'd say, the 20th, that should be good. Um, and then we have our business meeting at Worldcon, um, which is uh, going to be Saturday, August 20th. Um, room is to be determined uh, as of now, but if you have any agenda items that you'd like us to bring up at that meeting, you have to get those to secretary at cifwa.org by Friday, July 15th, 2016. And those are the only deadlines I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, I can't think of any myself, uh, but I operate... Oh, I do have one more. I'm sorry. So the ReLear program uh, run by Matthew Johnson, um, I'm just going to give a brief example of what this is. So um, I guess France has scanned many books it considers to be orphan works in order to make them available through a public database. Uh, the database has been found to contain many titles that are clearly not orphan works or in the public domain, including a number by prominent SF and fantasy authors. So you'll have until September 20th, 2016 to inform them that you'd like to either have um, I guess there's some compensation or to have it uh, taken down. Uh, if, you if you want any more information about that, you th uh, should write matthew.johnson at ziffa.org. Thank you. And then I think that kind of underscores that one of the things that we try to do is protect our members and their copyright. I know in the most recent issue of the Singularity we had, calls uh, where we mentioned sites that uh, where we had found member uh, member stuff and where we urge people to check and see if and if you have stuff on that mail me so I can add it to sort of the collective complaint. 
So we're at our last kind of six minutes, and I don't. Uh, I did want to mention uh, the Locus Awards again, and uh, I'm looking forward to them. They're always here, in, or at least as long as I can remember, they're here in Seattle. And one of the things that uh, one of the traditions of them is not only do we have Connie Willis as sort of the MC, but everybody has to wear Hawaiian shirts. And so people spend months ahead of time trying to find the gaudiest, ugliest, most horrible Hawaiian shirts that you can, right? I've been kind of haunting the thrift shop for the last six months or so. But some people who are masochistic will deliberately leave their Hawaiian shirt at home because this gives you a chance to be scolded by Connie Willis. And, of course, you know, being scolded by Connie Willis is an experience in and of itself. Um, but I remember one year uh, Neil Gaiman was here, and so she'd actually gone out and gotten him a black-on-black -black Hawaiian shirt, which he then failed to wear to the ceremony of... <laughs> If I'm remembering correctly. Um, are there any sort of last... This is, the I think, last time we devolved into a discussion of plushies at this point, and I'm happy to talk about plushies. Happy, oh, nobody asks Bud about joining SIFWA. He is reminding me, Bud, how did you come to join SIFWA? Tell us about joining SIFWA. Well, I've always been interested in science fiction, and... Uh, I thought I'd write a couple stories and sell them and join the organization. That was back in 75. And uh, it took me about 35 stories and uh, probably nearly 100 rejections before I sold the first one to, uh, to a, a analog. Ben Bogle was the editor then. And a year later, I sold another one. So that satisfied me. So for 13 years, I didn't write anything. And then in 91, I, saw, I said, well, I wrote a couple pieces for uh, the Chesapeake Bay magazine, and they sold. And I said, well, I'll start writing something for Analog again. And lo and behold, out of the next six stories, uh, Stan Schmidt bought five of them. So I thought it might be wise to uh, join the organization now that I was a real writer. And uh, I did not know that my earlier membership – qualified me. So I I said, well, I've got at least three. That ought to get me in there. And then, so I've been a member since 1977, I guess, uh, in one way. Or put another way, I've been a serious member since 1992. I'm trying to think. So 1977, that's like 23 plus 16. God, holy crap, bud. You've been around a long time. Yeah, my wife keeps reminding me of that. That's 39 years, but don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> so how do you think the organization has changed? I mean, like, like how, you're one of the people, I think, with a decent perspective on this, because I came in in 2005, and I've only seen it change over the last 10 years. Uh, we know Aaron's to 2012. Derek, when did you come in? Uh, 2011. 2011. And Kate, you've been around since what, 2009? 11. What? 11. 11? Yeah, okay. I started volunteering probably around 2009, but I okay. well, officially of 2011. So, so close this out by, by, by musing about how you think the organization has changed over the last almost four decades. Well, the forum has evolved from 10, 10 mimeographed and Xerox sheets held together with a staple. <laughs> It had a always had a stamp put on it crookedly. I never understood why somebody couldn't even line up the damn uh, stamp correctly. Uh, when I came back, I got this slick paper bulletin, and I thought, "Oh my God, you know the organization has really grown up." And then I uh, started reading when I started joining the uh, Genie Chain and realized, "No, the organization has not grown up. They're <laughs> the same bunch of infantile bastards they were always, always." And uh, after I got in, I realized that almost everybody in the writing business is a failure in their own mind because there's a huge dose of imposter syndrome going around among the membership. And, I doubt, and it, it was quite humbling to realize that even the greats are kind of embarrassed that they haven't done better. So it's a, 
it's been an interesting thing. Uh, I, I, I remarked, I hate name droppers, but uh, as I was remarking to Stan, Stan, Stan Smith the other day, the, at the Nebula Mass signing, I said, why aren't there any of the really, really greats here in the, in, in the Mass signing that I'm used to seeing? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, the only people here are, are my friends, you know, uh, Lawrence Schoen, Chuck Gannon, Fran Wild. And all of a sudden, I stopped and said, "Oh shit, I'm one of the, I'm one of the, I'm one of the old guys now." <laughs> That's awesome, and I, I love the the idea. Like even the greats don't want to admit they could have done better. I'm sure that, that there are people we don't want to believe that's true of, but it is true. So on that note, I'm going to suggest that this particular gang of imposters sign out, and we'll be back in two weeks and talk more about Sifwa, and I'm about to stop the broadcast, and here we go.